everyone. Thank you so much for joining. We're going to get started here in just one second. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for joining our first grads webinar for 2020. My name is Michelle Winters. I'm VP of Sales here at Gobi um, for our ESG group. And um, thank you for joining us. We have people from all over the world with, with us today. During this webinar, we're going to be discussing the impacts of GRES over the last 10 years and moving into 2020 and beyond, as well as some important updates to the GRES assessment with the 2020 pre-release, and then opening it up to questions and answers um, for the entire group, utilizing the um, functionality, so the questions box, which should be in your control panel, likely in the top right corner. Um, so the session today will also be recorded and sent to all participants. So before we begin, I'd like to introduce you to our speakers. So we're lucky enough to have with us on the line Dan Winters, Head of Americas at Grez. We also have Roxana Sayu, Director of ESG and Real Estate at Grez. So they're going to be joining in our, our experts here. Um, from the Gobi team, we also have Christina Chow, an ESG consultant at Gobi and in-house ex expertise on the KPI side as well as Mari Bishop, who leads up one of our teams here at Gobi and specializes in the ESG strategy and planning. Um, so with that being said, um, Dan is going to get us kick-started here, and uh, we're ready to go. So Dan, all you. Excellent. Michelle, thank you so much. Chris, the rest of the Gobi team, thanks for having us to kick off the year. I, you know, January is still in single digits. Uh, we've started a new decade, and, uh, and, and we're raring to go here at Grez. So with this, we're going to spend, uh, so, so the way that I've laid this, this deck out is to take some time and, and give a little update as to what's happened. But I wanted to do that by laying the framework for GRESB and 10 years of GRESB because we just published that report. And so I want to, so we're going to talk about, from my view, what, I'm, what I view as three phases of GRESB. First phase of sort of the market uh, development, the second phase of, of industry acceptance, and then where we're heading next, which is the performance phase. So I wanted to start here. This is a screenshot of our website from the insights section under news and releases. And we published our 10 years of GRESB report towards the end of the year. And when you read this, I, I, I call out the quote here on the left-hand side by Patrick Cantors. He's one of our board of director members and founding member of GRESB. And it talks about why GRES was created. And the reason was it was simple, right? It was to put together uniform and consistent metrics to measure sustainability of real estate and, and, and now real asset portfolios. Because in, in the, this last thing here, if you can't measure and compare, it's very difficult if you are an asset owner to really engage with your fund managers and, and the listed property companies on how they might find ways to improve. So I encourage people to go and take a look at this 10 years of GRES report. It's pretty thoughtful. And a lot of the questions that I think people are having, uh, we, we worked really hard to address in, you know, the, in preparing for what's ahead with, with that section. So the URL is down there. And let's see if I can move these slides. I'm stuck. Oh, oh there we go. Good. Okay, so I, I talked about these three phases. Phase one of market development. Two, we have industry adoption, and we just flip in this calendar to move into what I'm viewing as the performance metrics section or, or, or phase of, of the whole ESG movement in real estate. So just to remind people what we do at Grez, right, where we assess and benchmark ESG performance of real asset portfolios, and we validate that information when it comes in, and we provide what uh, standardized, what I'm going to call non-financial data to capital markets and, and people that are, are interested in finding out how their managers are doing on ES&G. Okay, so in 2009, we released the Grez Real Estate Assessment. It's been at this for 10 years. Sorry about my transitions here. In 2016, we launched the Infrastructure Assessment, and that's for real asset portfolios that are a little bit different from real estate, cell towers, uh, solar farms, uh, wind, th things that are, are not real estate. And infrastructure has gotten quite an uptick over the past several years. Uh, last year, we had 100 funds and 400 assets submit to the infra assessment. And we're pretty pleased with, with our market development efforts. So let's talk about phase one. So in phase one, when Grez was this kernel of an idea back in 2009, a couple key decisions were made. One was to take an ISO approach. And that is on the left-hand side, plan, do, check, act. 
right? And you can see how that manifests itself within the real estate industry with targets and policies, whether you have a data management system and what are you doing to reduce your consumption? Are you doing offsets to try to get to a net zero portfolio? All of those actions are being taken. On the right hand side, this is how it's been tailored to the real estate industry. The seven aspects of GRES are now you know, pretty well co codified within the global real estate industry. And so from performance indicators to building certifications, these really, you know, and policies and disclosures, these map into two different groups. One is sort of a management philosophy, and the next is a performance component. So I wanna plant that seed for a minute because we're gonna get back to that in a second. The second thing we did at Grez in those first market development years is we put together a really strong governance structure. So we have a board of directors, there's three investor members that are part of it, there's three non-executive directors, uh, two of them are from the industry associations. We've got Michael Brooks from RealPAC up in Canada who took Steve Wexler's spot. Steve Wexler was the, or is the CEO of Nareet and he was a founding uh, board member for many, many years. Uh, so we have very solid representation in North America from a, a really strong perspective of folks. There's the Grez staff. Our staff has grown to, we're, we're approaching 30, and I know that we'll surpass that in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and that's up from, I think it was 10 or 12 when I joined five years ago. Uh, and so our staff continues to get stronger and stronger, and, and there, there's more headcount as, as we continue to have a bigger impact within the industry. And then on the left and the right side, we've got our advisory boards. And the advisory boards are made up of institutional investors. Below that are the benchmark committees, which are made up of the participants. We get an awful lot of feedback from institutional investors, from the participants, through these committees, and then just writ large uh, through you know, uh, the communications that come in from our members. So here's, I, I went back and I looked, every year we would do this assessment and we would issue a report. So there were research reports in 2011, 12, 13, and 14, and, and this was the graph that was in the 2014 report. And you can see how the industry changed, 20, at least through the scores in Grez, right? 2011, if you re recall the names of those quadrants back in, you know, back a long time ago, five, six years ago, green starters, right? A lot of folks were down there just starting to you know, try to figure this out. And people were pushing to get in the upper right, the green star column. Or, or quadrant, excuse me. And so you can see how the scores, 2011, 12, 13, they went up and to the right. Healy knows, Healy at Gobi knows that my favorite saying is up and to the right. That's what we want. And, but then in 2014, something happened. There was a schism. And what happened is the assessment changed a little bit. We took out some questions that weren't as relevant. We added some other things. We changed some performance components and it had, a, 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 uh, you know, it had an impact on the results. So I want you to hold on to that idea as well as we then move into phase two of GRES. And phase two is industry adoption, 2015 to 2019. So what happened in that phase is we have our three original founding investor members that are circled in green and they attracted an awful lot of folks. We've now over, over this next five years have grown to have over a hundred institutional investor members. These are some of their logos. And they use ESG information with the, the, our, our analytical tools to engage with their fund managers. So if you kind of, other things that happen is, is we attracted a lot of participant members as well. And so from the footer of our website, you can go down and you can take a look in the directory. Our investor members, our partners like Gobi that have been great to help really push forward these ideas of sustainability and engage with the industry, right? So it's a, it's a team effort. It's a team effort by the 150 plus people that are on this call, the now over 500 members that are part of GRESB and whichever of the four groups that you're part of in that directory, right? It's been a great, great decade. So then, you know, what did those folks need? Well, they needed some resources. They needed, you know, our institutional investors, they need guidance on how to engage. The participants need some guidance on how to participate. And so all of a sudden, the amount of content on our, on our website started to explode. So from the investor member standpoint, right, we've got uh, investor engagement guides and how to navigate the portal. And there's things that they're doing throughout the year. They're inviting their funds to participate. They can track the response from April 1st to July 1st when that's submitted. Are you 20% done? Are you 80% done? Have you finished? Are you not going to complete an assessment this year? All of those things are, are tracked. And then they can access data by requesting it from the participant. 
If you're a listed property company, that doesn't really apply because you're in a separate data set. But if you're a private equity fund or firm, your results are yours and that they they're only available to investor members that get, ask through our portal for a data access request. Obviously, people are looking at this benchmark report. That's the, the product that comes out on an annual basis in September. How did you do against peers? What are priorities that you have going forward? So on that side, that's the guidance for the investor members. Well, as more investors became part of GRESB, it drove participation. So you can see in 2014, right, we had you know 600 and now we've had over 1,000. So we've continued up and to the right. We've had a real nice run here in North America. We're at like 250 and close to 500 in Europe. So as participation started to drive forward, participants needed some information. You need webinars like this. You need things that are on our website. So this, there's this step-by-step -step guide to successfully completing your GRESB assessment. I encourage the folks here to go take a look at this, right? And at the bottom line, the, the, the thing that's circled in the bottom left, we're here to support you. I can't emphasize that enough, right? We wanna be a partner in your success and help you uh, establish and grow an ESG program. We don't do consulting at Grez. We have this framework and we put it out there and we continue to progress and improve it every year. And so from the run from 2014 to 2019, looks like that. Nice straight line up and to the right, good solid five-year history of uh, continued industry advancement when it comes to ESG. Some things to note on this graphic are the, the two axes. We've got on the left-hand side, management and policy, right? That's sort of a management-oriented component. Do you have policies, procedures? What's your portfolio management view of ESG? And then the bottom uh, axis is implementation and measurement. And that really gets at the, the asset level data and, and how, you know, companies are putting targets, are they achieving those targets, and how is that really coming into play? This graph is to scale. So management and policy accounts for 23% of the overall GRESB score, and implementation and measurement is 77%. Hold on to that thought. We're going to come circle back to that in a little while. Okay, so then I talked about the explosion of content. Well, if you click on the insights box right next to the login button at the upper right of our website, you see that there's tremendous uh, you know, things that come into us uh, that, that we're posting out there. So this is under the news and releases. I talked about the 10 years of Grez that's right there. That's where you can access it and find it. Um, things that I think people are interested in on this call are the Grez real estate assessments development. And so there's a posting on that along with the release of the 2020 assessment. And that's where you can get some more background information. Okay, so also within Insights, we have contributors. Contributors are folks like Gobi. I know you guys have posted a number of articles over the years. Our ecosystem wants to communicate their best practices, their achievements, and their accomplishments. And so if you go to Grezb Insights, or if you wanna to contribute to Grezb Insights, I encourage you to do that. You can see over the past uh, several weeks, there's been a lot of focus on stakeholder engagement. I'm looking at the titles of these articles, right? Um, and so the, those are being contributed by our partners. Also here, you can find that real estate assessments development section. Wanted to emphasize that and the 10 years of Grez that we led off with, that's right here. So those are two nice content pieces that were published towards the end of the year, maybe when all, uh, many of us were on break, that it would be a, a nice idea for the folks in the line to circle back and take a look at those two, two documents. Okay, so the 10 years of Grez, just the, you know, the big, oh, ooh, well, the big highlight, let's see if we can go back. Big highlight is we've grown from three founding institutional investor members to well over 100. We've had a number join at the a number of new ones join at the end of the year, and they account for a lot of money, 22 trillion dollars. We went from roughly 200 participants to over a thousand. So 10 years, 100 institutional investors, a thousand participants, and that covers 100,000 properties globally. Last year, we received almost 70,000 uh, assets with data. And that means the trailing 12 months of energy water waste, 70,000 assets came in with, with data within the system. That means not all assets can get data. We understand there's headwinds to doing that, but the industry has taken strong strides, particularly over the past four to five years, uh, and 70,000 was a great number. So here we are 
at the advent of 2020, we're in the phase three, and the focus is really more and more on performance metrics. So why is that? So here there's, there's a number of, of Initi institutional investor driven initiatives, right? Whether it's the Montreal pledge that came out in 2016, which was signed by 150 institutional investors to do a carbon footprint report of their entire financial portfolio. If you're CalPERS and you've got $360 billion and you're going to do a carbon footprint report, you know, that's a daunting task and you need serious data. So one of the things CalPERS did in 2016 is they joined Grez. And they did it for access to their real estate and infrastructure funds and wanting to have them engage and start putting uh, sort of business processes in place to be able to get metrics so they can do and fulfill that Montreal pledge and do that carbon footprint report. So every one of CalPERS separate accounts participates in Grez and more and more of their infrastructure fund managers are participating in Grez and they're in great position to be able to fulfill that pledge. The, the logo right above that, TCFD, is what's being talked about now within the industry, tax, Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, right? And so let's take a look at that on the next slide. If you, on the right-hand side, you look at TCFD, right? And what are they after? They're, they're, they're trying to understand governance around, you know, climate change. What is the company, or in, in our case, a portfolio? Think about that. What are they doing about those things? How does it implement their strategy? How does it... How do they integrate that into their strategy? How do they implement it in risk management? And what sort of metrics and targets are they following? Well, if you map that up against GRES, that looks an awful lot like what the GRES assessment is. So the point of this is that organizations that are uh, engaged in and doing the GRES assessment are very well positioned to be able to issue TCFD reports. And we are uh, very closely aligned when, and, and part of all of these different groups to make sure that our tailored approach, this by industry for industry construct of GRES uh, being for real estate can, can map well and be a useful tool for responding to these, these other investor initiatives. Okay, so let's talk about, let's switch gears here and talk about phase three and some advances that are happening within the GRES assessment. So first things first, so one of the big changes is that all 2020 benchmark participants will become GRES members. We were 10 years as an industry-driven benchmark. We've got a strong engagement track record, and our objective is to really accelerate industry commitment. And so we're going to see everybody now who's participating in the benchmark become a member of GRESP. Our IT team has been hard at work throughout uh, the fourth quarter, and there's a number of portal improvements that are coming. We do get tremendous kudos for our portal when it opens up on April 1st. It's, it's quite user-friendly, it's easy to use, and people are in it for a three-month duration, right? Because you, you don't log in on April 1st and finish it that afternoon. You're constantly updating and getting new documents and finding data and whatnot. And so things that are being implemented right now are improved error reports, more information on, on scoring. Uh, you can read our scoring document that's in the resources section on GRES to understand how the scorings and weights are allocated. Uh, the validation decision rationale is available to uh, all of the last year's participants uh, in their benchmark reports. So you can read about why things were fully partially or not accepted. And the whole objective here is to improve submission quality. We're, we've been doing great, but there's always more improvements that can be done. And so look for some nice new features within the portal when you get to log in on April 1st. Okay, third thing, and this, this is a, a new concept, is the concept of a review period. So for this year, the, t the, the cycle of GRESB has been releasing results the first Wednesday of September after Labor Day. This year, we're aiming for a September 1st launch of what we're calling preliminary benchmark reports, right? So on September 1st, people are going to get their preliminary score. There's a review period. That review period happens in September 2020, and this is an opportunity for people to look at their, at their benchmark reports and, and see if there are some kind of glaring error or something that's amiss, right? This is a very rare thing when it happens, but it had, but some rare things have occurred. And so we wanted to give an opportunity as the stakes are getting raised on this ESG information to provide for a review period. And then final results will be released on October 1st, and that will include rankings and, and, and the final scores that can be distributed to investors. 
And so for some additional information here, you can go to that URL and you can see what the timeline looks like. Another big conceptual thing happening, and this is the seed I planted before, is we're splitting the assessment into, a, and we're, we're mapping the questions into management-oriented questions or performance-oriented questions. So management component is gonna focus on the five things on the left, strategy, policies, risk management, stakeholder engagement and reporting, right? And how well you do against your peers on those issues. Another important reason why we're doing this, not only for the alignment with the, the, the logos above it, but also for private equity funds that are in fundraising mode. There's enough funds out there that approach us to say, hey, we don't have any assets yet, but we want to engage, we want to improve, we want to you know, be able to demonstrate our ESG capabilities and credibilities. So having the ability to do the management component is the whole idea behind that. Once assets come into that portfolio in say year two or three, then they would be in position to be able to do the performance component, right? That works for all por portfolios that have standing assets and then the portfolios that will soon be having uh, standing assets within it, right? And so the performance component is targeting the, the seven different bullets right here. And it's, do you have targets on energy efficiency, greenhouse gas emission reductions? Uh, what do your building certifications look like? How are you doing on performance indica indicators? It's really the whole you know, asset level data orientation of GRES comes out in the performance component. So that split is happening. It's not that big of a deal, but it is something to be aware of, right? And so here's the idea. We wanna have folks keep climbing the ladder. We're, we're clustering in the upper right. I've been talking about this at our results events for the past two years. And so as we continue to move up and move forward as an industry, you know, management policy, get those in place. And guess what? Companies begin to implement, they begin to measure and performance improves. And that's what this is all designed to do is we're looking ahead for the next, I don't know, three, five, seven years. The last final really big change, if you will, is that asset level data is required in order to be able to get the GRES performance score. And when we when we talk about required, it's it's being able to identify where your assets are and, and be able to put forward a a comprehensive list to say here are all of the assets in this portfolio. Here's you know the 100,000 square foot at 123 Main Street in Chicago, and it is an office building, right? And so on down the line. Consumption data is is not required. It's meant to be put in there as it's available, right? So we know that it's a continual struggle, but I want to reinforce that 70,000 properties were able to get asset level data and reported in the GRESB last year. So we continue to chip away at that as an industry, as a collective group, and it's getting better and better over time. And we're excited by that. So the idea is ESG data is flowing up from the property level and up to the capital markets, and GRESB helps facilitate that. Okay, so here's the impact. So history, I, I brought this slide forward, this graphic forward. Uh, and here's what it looked like in 2014. There was this little schism and, and scores sort of moved sideways a little bit. And then we had that uphill climb from there. So that began to look like this. And you can see what I mentioned before, this clustering in the upper right. So when I, uh, the, the, the team at Amsterdam, Roxana's team, uh, did an analysis of the thousand and plus submissions that came in last year and said, okay, with this performance split, what do the impacts of the scores look like this year if, if, if we do that? And we looked at the 2019 data set and we projected what it might look like for 2020. And here's what we found. We found that management scores are probably gonna go up a little bit, maybe upwards of close to five points. We also found that performance scores might go down a little bit. Guess what? The same number of points, the five points, which is great. So on balance, things are feeling pretty equal. However, management policy is worth 23%, implementation and measurement is 77%. So it could likely be that scores drop a little bit this year. That said, I'm aware that there's been tremendous momentum on ESG and companies continue to push to the up and to the right. So that red dot there is my projection of where scores are going to be in 2020, which is you know a little bit higher on management. I'm seeing some clustering at the very top at the 100 scale, but a little less on performance. So I think we're going to move backwards there, and I think it's going to be perfectly aligned with, with uh, everybody's expectations. 
So with that, I want to take a breath, take a break, turn over to Michelle and Gobi, <laughs> and uh, see see what you guys think, and and offer some some fo uh, some content to the folks, and then we're going to bring Roxana into the conversation, and we can talk some real specifics about you know data and and uh, you know whatever the questions are from the crowd. Go ahead, Michelle. Yeah, perfect. That was fantastic, Dan. So we appreciate that really great overview um, and exactly what Dan was saying a second ago. So we're going to spend maybe a slide or so um, just highlighting some of the um, key aspects that Gobi had in terms of a takeaway from the pre-release this year. Um, so with that, uh, Christine's going to start us off. Mari's got a couple of comments and we'll, uh, we'll dive into the questions right after. Thanks, Michelle. Um, so yeah, to cover a couple of key asset level spreadsheet changes from the 2020 pre-release that were made publicly available, um, you might have noticed that now the energy, water, and waste efficiency measures, as well as technical building assessments, are tracked at the asset level on a yes-no basis, and they're now actually included as a part of the asset level spreadsheet in a separate tab. Um, the questions that were previously within the survey have been removed, and no supplemental documentation will be required. The same goes for building certifications, which are now included in the asset level spreadsheet also as a separate tab. And you may have also noticed that previously reporting characteristics were all grouped into one, but now it's split out into asset characteristics as well as reporting characteristics into two separate tabs. Um, where asset characteristics now cover the general property details like address, um, gross asset value, and floor area, while the reporting characteristics focuses on vacancy, ownership period, and standing investment status. Data availability date ranges are also now mandatory fields in all the energy, water, waste tabs, um, where applicants are required to include from and to dates for which the data became available for each of the assets. Scope 3 emissions are also um, in the 2020 GRES assessment should be calculated now as the um, emissions associated with tenant controlled areas. So maximum data coverage should now correspond to tenant areas generating the emissions. Um, and to hand it off to Mari to go over some of the qualitative changes. Yes, thank you, Christine. Um, so just a quick overview on the qualitative side. I know uh, Dan and Christine already talked about um, some of the changes that we're seeing on the data side, that at the level spreadsheet. Um, and to kind of re reiterate on what Dan was talking about, uh, there's not any crazy big changes this year on the qualitative side. However, there has been a bit of a shuffling, um, kind of like a restructure of how the assessment is set up. Uh, when you before saw seven categories, uh, now those seven categories are three components, performance and management, which Dan uh, spoke about a little bit uh, earlier, and the development component, which is the third piece uh, that applies to your portfolio, if your portfolio does indeed uh, do development work uh, within any of your assets. Uh, there's also the new construction portion, uh, which uh, previously was uh, considered as kind of like an extra, uh, you know, depending again, if you if your portfolio performed development uh, now has been uh, put within into those performance management and development components. Uh, so the questions have kind of been, you know, absorbed by those categories, and the resilience uh, resilience module is still considered um, optional, uh, but it's still out there. And I know that we at Gobi, and I'm sure Dan will too, uh, strongly encourage everybody to participate on that one. Um, but overall, a removal, consolidation of questions, so uh, to kind of get everything a little more streamlined and clear. And uh, like we've already covered uh, during the first 30 minutes, uh, there's an increased focus on asset level characteristics uh, on the data side and on the questions as well. Awesome. So yeah, that well, was well, well Michelle, ahead, let me Dan. jump in really quick. I'm so glad that you brought up the resilience yeah. module. Yeah, we've had uh, a lot of interest and uptick in participation in that, both on the real estate and infrastructure side. It maps quite well with TCFD, right? Is there a strategy? Can you have metrics, right, around uh, climate change, as well as you know what's been a, become a big topic, which is asset level resilience, and, and how's the portfolio thinking about those issues? So 
it's a you know this is a benchmarking exercise and it's an exercise for internal what are you doing and then allows you when you get some results to do some introspection as a company to say well you know what are what are initiatives and, and priorities that we should put in place as we navigate to the future so i just wanted to emphasize that michelle let me turn back to you no, that was perfect, and I think that's one of the things that we also um, hear frequently from our clients is what are some areas that we can drive improvements, what are some areas to focus on. Um, resiliency is one that we definitely recommend our clients to begin implementing as an, a, an initiative if they haven't already um, and aligning with the updates that are happening within GRES. Um, and the other one we've been seeing recently as well as the community side, the community components of um, implementing that has been, I think, an increase in, in initiatives um, across our clients as well. Um, perfect. So what we'd love to do and what we wanted to spend a good portion of this webinar doing is really opening it up to questions. We're incredibly fortunate to have both Roxana and Dan available on the call today. I see that quite a few of you have been asking questions over into the side, um, and we want this to be an open forum. So please, if you're listening, you have questions, um, add them to the, to the side panel for us. Uh, we're going to dive right into them, and then I'll send them off to either a couple of GOBE team members here or Roxana as well. Um, Roxana, are you able to um, hear us and speak as well? Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm online. Perfect. Well, perfect, because I think the first question that we have is a pretty technical one that I know we had initially mentioned with you and that I'd love to shoot off to you first here. Uh, and I'm going to read it. It's a little bit long, so everyone on the call, hopefully, um, can, we can follow along with this. But please, like I said, either chat or question if you'd like us to repeat anything. So the first question we have, um, on the asset level spreadsheet, it now categorizes whole building data by tenant and landlord controls. If we have collected aggregated data from utility providers, which combines that landlord controlled and tenant controlled usage, how should we report the data if it is strictly separated between these two categories? Uh, Roxana, if you wouldn't mind kind of taking that one and we can add to it from there. No, not at all. And I think I should start with uh, a bit of background here because um, um, a few years ago, GRASS introduced this uh, split in between managed and indirectly managed assets. And that's a classification that we introduced and we defined because we wanted to make a distinction in between assets, buildings that were mostly or predominantly controlled and uh, um, uh, managed by the landlord, as opposed to tenants where the, the tenant uh, had um, most responsibility and the uh, utmost responsibility around uh, what kind of efficiency measures would be implemented, what kind of uh, um, uh, utility contracts would be signed, and so on. Um, as we're moving into more granular data and with a move to uh, asset level reporting and uh, uh, having visibility into what the assets are doing and focusing more on what performance means, um, we're able to go uh, deeper into uh, into how the assets operate. And so um, a big part of our assessment development effort this year was towards industry consolidation and terminology cleanup, uh, which is why we're moving away from the split of uh, managed assets and indirectly managed assets. It's merely a terminology change because the way that we interpret uh, the relationship between the landlord and the tenant remains the same. Um, so to answer your question specifically, uh, when in previous situations where you would only have whole building data uh, and you would only report managed assets, whole building data, um, you can still do that. It's just going to be called landlord controlled um, areas, um, whole building data. It's pretty much the same thing. But instead of talking about managed assets, you're just going to report that data under the landlord control spaces. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I think that was a fantastic clarification as well on where we can put that data now, now that the asset management um, spreadsheet has changed slightly. And similar to, I think, a um, very specific question on where to kind of put additional information. So technical assessments are now tracked at the asset level spreadsheet through yes or no dropdown. Do we need to upload any of additional supporting documentation or um, is it fine to leave as is? Well, and Roxanne, I'll kick that back over to you. Yes. I think that's a piece of good news for all uh, participants on the line who used to have to compile this uh, 
uh, supporting evidence for these indicators. Mm -hmm. As of 2020, it is no longer necessary or required to upload supporting evidence. Um, uh, we've been tracking this kind of information for a few years and having validating, having validated um, supporting evidence as well as the data reported for a few years, we now have a sufficient body of evidence to demonstrate that um, when an answer, uh, when these uh, indicators are answered and when data is submitted here, it is generally very easy to provide supporting evidence and compliance with a standard set of requirements around supporting evidence. And so we wanted to take away some of the burden from the participant side when it uh, comes down to reporting supporting evidence and also take away some of the validation with uh, burden from, from our side and rather focus those efforts on other indicators and deserve additional um, input. So uh, we, we do believe that uh, uh, technical billing assessments um, uh, and implementing efficiency measures remains very important and uh, we track that information at the asset level, we'll be able to provide uh, a lot of uh, industry trend analysis and aggregate information around those, um, but we will no longer require supporting evidence, which I think is uh, it's going to save a lot of work from uh, everyone's side. Perfect. And then actually to kind of build on that, another question that we're receiving is in regards to the asset level data, how is that used for scoring or who owns the asset level data and who has access to the asset level data? So I know we've probably discussed that before in a previous webinar, but just kind of building on that, is anything changing in regards to um, that data component, Roxana? Uh, not at all. So the participant holds um, complete control over who do they want to share that information with. Um, by default, we will not we will not share that data with investors. Um, um, investors will continue to have access only to portfolio level aggregate uh, results. However, if the participant wants to share uh, the asset level data as well as the asset level output, um, they'll be able to control that and share access to investors from their side. Perfect. Great. Well, we're getting a lot of great questions coming in, so of course, please keep sending them. I'm going to keep going through them um, here for us. Another one that was indicated uh, that I think went a little bit to Dan in some of um, what you were mentioning in your presentation here, but there's a lot of momentum behind convergence with the um, ESG reporting formats to TCFD and SASB becoming core standards. How is GREB GRESB, um, consistent and inconsistent um, with maybe SASB in particular? Yeah, I responded to Catherine uh, just individually, but I'll, I'll say for the for everybody here on the call. So back in 2016, when SASB, uh, uh, you know, the, the, they're after 77 different verticals, whether it's software, airlines, technology, right? So they get to real estate, and it's a it's a sector, it's a vertical, and Gresby had been around for. Oh, did I say that? Gresby had been around for. Uh, seven years at that time, and so uh, their their first shot was 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 off the mark, and some meetings were convened, and and as a result, the SASB is basically 95% Gresby, maybe 98%. Right? We we let them uh, look at our our materials and basically copy what we had because we had coalesce the industry. So if you're doing uh, a GRESB assessment, you have all the metrics in place to be able to choose to report under the SASB uh, constructs in your 10Ks and Qs. Great. Another question that actually maybe Dan uh, related to your presentation, um, there's a couple of questions related to the review period that you were mentioning. Um, so is this something that you can maybe dive into a little bit further on? Is that going to be replacing response checks? It sounds like it's you know after. Could you dive into that a little bit in more detail? Yeah, Roxana, do you want to lead and I'll fill in blanks if needed? Sure, sure. Um, so this um, uh, review period is not meant to replace any of the other processes that already exist. Um, as, uh, as, as Dan said, we've been um, running this assessment <clears throat> for the past 10 years with a set process, reporting period, um, uh, there's a reporting period, there's a validation and scoring period, results come out and that's it. And because we're talking about the dynamic benchmark, there's nothing much you can do to the data set after the fact because a change in somebody's data set will have an impact on everyone's data set. 
Now, as uh, this data becomes more and more relevant and starts being built into all sorts of uh, um, investment decisions and products and so on, um, it's been signaled to us, over, especially over the last couple of years, that uh, we need to have a risk management process built into the standard reporting process because mistakes can uh, occur on any one side. Uh, a small reporting mistake uh, or apparently a small reporting mistake can have a big impact on the overall score. And what we want to make sure is that the final reports and the results that we put out there are as complete and accurate and representative of the situation on the ground as possible. So we built in this uh, uh, period, results uh, review period um, into the calendar to serve as a buffer uh, for correcting any, uh, any of these very significant, well, let's, uh, let's call them errors or mistakes or um, oversights or, I don't know, things that are, um, uh, were not correctly represented to begin with, uh, both from our side and the participant side. In an ideal world, this month will not be used for anything. So there will be this one month period where nothing will have to change and uh, there will be no edits whatsoever to the data set and everything is fine. And we hope that's going to be the case, but uh, we also know that um, it's time to sort of have this risk management process in place to ensure that the final data set is correct and we've done everything we can possibly do to ensure that. So we continue to encourage everyone to go for a response check, to check and double check and triple check their answers before they submit, um, because it's always better to prevent than, uh, uh, than to cure um, anything once it happens. Absolutely. Perfect. Okay. And are all of the um, dates uh, still anticipated to be the same with the um, pre-check this year? Uh, so uh, you mean the response check? The response check, sorry, yes. Yeah, the, uh, the response check calendar remains the same. Everything that has to do with the reporting period remains the same. Um, so that's still going to be uh, in between April and, uh, and June. Um, this the, this uh, review period doesn't impact the, uh, the reporting process whatsoever. Um, the only difference compared to the previous calendar, GRESS calendar is the fact that instead of having the official results launch in September, we're now going to have it in October. Perfect. I'll get that on my calendar. <laughs> um, so then kind of leading into a few other questions that are listed here. Uh, a lot of the questions that we're seeing are related to, um, of course, on the data side, which we also frequently see here at Gobi. Um, some of them are saying, you know, if we don't have all the data, is it worthwhile to, to even submit? Um, you know, will the reporting be required to respond on both management as well as performance, um, depending on the assets and their funds, or is this going to become more of an option in the future? Um, I know our team has a couple thoughts here, but maybe Roxana, if you want to take that first, then we can expand on it from there. So to address the first part of your question, um, if you don't have all the data, absolutely, it's definitely worth reporting. Um, actually, there are very few portfolios and very few fund managers out there that actually have all the data. That's, I would say that's more rare than, uh, having all the data is more rare than not having all the data. And um, the GRESS exercise, the GRESS process, is a very educational process, especially for those that don't really know uh, where to start and have very um, few bits and pieces of information and are looking for a framework that helps them puzzle everything together and get a sense of what they're meant to do from a new perspective. Um, and of course, market behavior comes into place and the, the laws of competition come into place and nobody wants to be the last, nobody wants to be uh, at the bottom of, uh, of the ranking. And that's exactly what we're trying to encourage. And um, uh, the moment this framework is, uh, uh, is able to encourage improvements and or drive any sort of improvements, that's uh, perfect. Sorry, sorry, you heard me do that, Rox. I was looking at the number of questions that are in this chat box. Oh my goodness, there's like 40 of them. Um, look, if if you score, a, trying to a, organize. A, oh my gosh, if you score a 26, 
that's great. You have information and that's that's awesome, right? It's This is a benchmark. If you score a 62, obviously people want to score a 62. It's better than a 26. But when I look at people and, and, and firms that have participated for six, seven, eight, nine years in a row, that's the trajectory, right? 17, 22, 27. And then, you know, all of a sudden maybe there's a breakout. 45 becomes a 60 becomes an 80, right? That's the idea, but by gosh, nobody's sitting on their hands waiting for the perfect score. It's 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 the elusive thing. You gotta get in the game. Yeah, and uh, I think yeah, and I... there are a couple of other parts too. Uh, what was the last part of your question? Sorry. No, no, I think that was, was perfect. I think the other piece is that there's a lot of questions related to some of the changes that are occurring on the management and the, the performance side. So um, I think the questions are, are we seeing that many of the questions are essentially the same, but maybe just segmented differently and streamlined? Yeah, absolutely. So um, part of this new structural um, um, update um, does offer an increased level of flexibility of perhaps starting with the management bit and only submitting the management component. Now, that's a good start. And if that's all you can do at the beginning, that's uh, that's great. At least uh, um, that uh, gets used to the process, and you have a better feel of uh, where to begin and how to begin. And um, this whole reporting process is not as complex as it would be if you do the whole thing at once. However, um, it, it just uh, just reporting on the management side does not provide the full picture of what you're actually doing and what your portfolio actually does in terms of environmental performance. Um, and that's going to be clear from uh, the results as well, because um, you will only have access to a limited set of, um, of data points and, uh, and results and comparisons if you do one component as opposed to um, everything that, uh, that is relevant to a portfolio. So to be more specific, um, if you're managing or uh, if you own a standing investments portfolio, um, you will have to complete two components. One on management, that's um, evaluating the sustainability practices of the organization and everything applicable to this portfolio itself, things like policies and procedures and ESG strategy and ESG objectives. Um, and that will get a score, so that's the management score. And then separately, uh, you'll have the performance component that's uh, evaluating the performance of the underlying assets. And that's where all the data on energy and carbon and water and waste and tenant engagement and supply chain comes in. Um, and that will provide a performance score. Together, these two components and these two scores will determine the GRASS score. And the GRASS rating and the GRASS peer group and the GRASS rankings and basically all the high level um, uh, items that an investor would look at that uh, you would be able to communicate on and, and things like that. Otherwise, uh, of course, you can submit each component individually and stick to that, um, especially if it's your first year or perhaps uh, um, you're an opportunistic fund that's only interested in looking at uh, the management component that, that's perfectly fine, uh, but then you will only see how you do on the management side or conversely on the performance side. Great. Um, so a couple other questions here. I know we're going to be getting close to the end of time here, um, but I thought this one was a, a great one. Maybe, Dan, I know you talked to this quite a bit, but the question is, when investors ask what is the ROI for participating in GRESB as consumption reductions around performance can be obtained without reporting, how do you suggest that we answer that question and show a financial return um, without merely showing the efficiency gains? I know oh, you love to talk to this, Dan. No, well, you, well, you chose that one. Actually, if you heard me clacking away back here, I was responding to that question privately. And what? <laughs> <laughs> so, look, ESG is baked into so many different corporate processes and 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 things from, I don't know, energy, water, waste. Yeah, but HR from tenant engagement, right? What's the what's the ROI of keeping another tenant around as opposed to having to release and do new TIs and, and have vacancy and all that? I don't know. And can and maybe but it's positive. And can you then tag it to oh the fact that we did Grez caused that to happen? I don't think so. Right. So my response to that question was was honestly it was like trying to figure out what your ROI is to go get an MBA. 
right? I did, I went and got an MBA and I have a second master's degree too. I didn't necessarily sit down and figure out that I was gonna get a 10, 12, 15% ROI on my tuition payments and room and board. But I said to myself, you know what, this is gonna be good. And these are, you know, if you look at Gresb, it's a series of best practices. You're benchmarking yourself against peers globally and going through the process, wash, rinse, repeat year after year after year shows organizations getting better. And the key question that I ask when I have one-on-one -on -one meetings, whether it's with a REIT or a private equity firm and their management team is, and, and I only ask this of folks that have been doing Gresb three years or longer. I look them in the eye and I say, is this worth it? Are you getting in a positive ROI, do you think, or is this just a bunch of busy work? And people will look at me and they'll say, we're highly confident that we are getting positive ROI. Is there some busy work in here? Yeah, right? However, and I've, I've had principals, founders of their companies look at me and say, and this happened in Chicago maybe three years ago, where somebody said to me, you know what, Dan, I've learned an awful lot about my company that I didn't know before. Yeah, I knew we had a couple of lead buildings here and there, but there's a lot of things going on here. And now that we've organized and, and sort of put a framework in place to figure this out, things are going great and we're excited and we're gonna do more. And that's the typical response I get. The question begs a numerical answer that I'm unwilling to give because it just doesn't work that way. I like the analogy. I, maybe I need, I already have a master's, but maybe I'll go get an MBA too. <laughs> um, no, that's perfect. Um, so I have a, a couple more technical related questions here that I want to um, fly through for a few minutes remaining. And then whatever we don't get to, keep those questions coming. Our team will be sure to respond separately for each of you. Um, and we'll be sure to share the questions with all the participants. Um, but I thought this was a good one. Um, at the end of Dan's presentation, I know that you were talking about the new construction um, being part of the module. And can we explain further in detail? And I'm actually going to turn things over to Mari for a couple minutes on our team's maybe talk through and then of course Roxana or Dan if you want to expand yeah so sorry I know I mentioned that uh, uh, very quickly in passing um, but it doesn't necessarily apply for everybody huh? so it it does apply if your portfolio has new construction within it of course um, and what you did before so what you did for 2019 if you participated uh, new construction was a module of its own uh, and it was kind of uh, not considered in the in the main survey response scoring. So now uh, there is no new construction module. Actually, there's no modules. There are components. Um, so all the questions, all of the uh, different points that are covered that were covered within that new construction are now part of those three components: uh, the management, performance, and development. And Therefore, uh, are also counted towards the overall score um, of your overall submission. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So the new construction major innovations aspects uh, morphed into the development component. And the good news for uh, any portfolio that has both standing investments and development projects is that they'll now get two reports: um, one focused on standing investments and one focused on development uh, uh, projects. Um, and that's really great. It's, uh, uh, it's the kind of feedback we've been receiving uh, for, for a few years and we weren't really able to implement it, but with a new structure that's possible. Um, and what effectively, what, what this means effectively is that we we'll now have two very um, good benchmarks, one for standing investments and one for development projects, and uh, we'll be able to provide very actionable insights and very uh, specific insights into both sides of the period. Um, so the new construction major innovation score um, will be elevated into uh, a proper report and into a complete analysis for anyone that has development projects. Yeah, I know that's something that we've definitely heard um, historically as well. So I think we're excited to see that, that as one of the, the upcoming changes. Um, Maybe a couple more technical questions here. Um, so one is, uh, do the energy efficiency measures and building certifications need to be loaded at the asset level, or is there still an option to report at the portfolio level? Um, Roxana, maybe I'll kick that over to you as a quick question. Both will have to be reported at the asset level, and there will be no option for portfolio level reporting. Great. 
Um, and then another uh, technical question. Um, can residential companies which have unit level, not asset level data still participate? Uh, yes, definitely, definitely. And I know the residential is always a bit of a weird duck in this uh, whole situation, um, but um, in the end, it comes down to the definition of the asset and uh, what, uh, what's most relevant in terms of how do you define asset. Um, so we'll put, uh, we'll put out uh, more specific guidance around that as well. Um, but obviously, residential is a sector and property type that's covered in the assessment, and um, um, it will be possible to report not at the unit level, um, but uh, to combine units and in, into assets and report at the asset level. Roxanne, a question for you: Have, have we published the 2020 guidance document yet? Is it? I, no. I don't know the status. That was going to be my next question, Dan. You're reading my mind. Well, this, <laughs> that question came in from Conan O'Connor in, in Toronto at, at uh, EPL. So I wanted to, since we're on that, when, when no. do you, what's the planning on that? So we've been busy uh, getting the assessment ready, and that was published uh, in a pre release version on the 19th of December. And we're now working on the reference guide. Um, the plan is to publish that on the 1st of March. Tremendous. Okay. Perfect. Yes, that was going to be my, my planned last question um, for the moment, so Dan really took it away from me, which is perfect timing. I think it's a great way to kind of wrap everything up. That'll be the next um, you know, big release, obviously, of update information from the grads team. Uh, and since we are coming to the end of our hour here, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. But if we didn't get to your question, we're going to collect all of these um, and reply back against the collective group. Um, and of course, utilize our resources with Roxana and Dan as needed. Um, but Dan or Roxana, anything that you would like to say from either of your ends before we yeah. we uh, wrap up this webinar? Yeah, I think the folks that were watching the screen probably saw me cruise through that appendix when this document is sent out. They know that there were some more slides that we didn't go through, really how institutional investors are, are gravitating around our data. And so I just wanted to leave with this closing remark about benchmarking, right? And it kind of feeds into what's the ROI of, of, of all of this. And it, it's, it's difficult, right? It's difficult to attribute causation or correlation to doing GRES. But if you look at this and what this assessment is, it is a series of global best practices for the real estate industry. So when I think about this and, and, and who and how and why, right? In phase one, why did people participate? Typically it fell into two camps, either curiosity or compliance. Compliance means that one of your LP investors said, hey, we want you to do this GRESD assessment. APG has over 300 uh, investments that participate in GRESP, 300 LP positions, right? And there are others with, with an awful lot as well. The other side of the coin is curiosity. People that have been doing sustainability, guys like Dave DeVos, who's been at this for a long time and is doing a great job in a very, you know, uh, an, an old line company, right? Curious. And so let's go, let's go benchmark ourselves, right? That's the participation driver. And here's what we saw, right? It kind of looked like that. And then the next phase we had we, you know, competition, you get that peer, you get that number, that peer benchmark, and you, it makes you celebrate if you score 82, and it makes you work harder if you score 28, because you see that your peers are actually doing things and they're doing more, and it got, gets organizations to set targets and meet those targets, right? So phase two is really all about competition. And then we saw what that looked like, big push to the upper right. And so let's end this with where we are in phase three. It's really continuous improvement, and it's all about risk management and business value. That, and it gets back to the question that was on the table, the ROI of sustainability, GRES, you know, a building certification, whatever it is, right? This is really all about continuous improvement, benchmarking, understanding where your strengths are, your weaknesses are, and going and tackling them as an organization. That's what the GRES uh, uh, sort of cycle of this annual assessment is all about, and we're really excited going into 2020. So thanks everybody for being part of this call. Um, Michelle, I'm gonna turn back to you. Those, that's, that's my piece. Just kick off the year. <laughs> I, think that's uh, a, I think it's a fantastic way to summarize it. I think we're looking forward to uh, great things ahead into 2020 and beyond. So thank you everyone on behalf of both Grez and Gobi um, for taking the time to join us today. If you should have any additional questions following when we close out this webinar, please feel re free to email at info at gobiinc.com. Um, we'll look forward to sending this webinar as well as the questions and answers out to the group. Thank you so much for your time and have a, a great start of the year. Thank you. Thank you.